morning, or good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the Harvard Kennedy School and to the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. I'm Sushma Raman, I'm the Executive Director. And it's my honor and privilege to invite you here today, and thank you for bringing such wonderful weather with you to Cambridge. Um, we're going to get our conference started today on the strategic consequences of the U.S. use of torture. Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege and honor for me to see the work over the past year evolve under the leadership of Douglas Johnson and Alberto Mora uh, in partnership with the West Point Center for the Rule of Law. Uh, to get us started, we have the privilege of hearing from our new dean, not so new dean, um, Douglas Elmendorf. Uh, he is also the Don K. Price Professor of Public Policy here at the uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Doug previously served as the director of the Congressional Budget Office from January 2009 through March 2015. Prior to joining the Congressional Budget Office, he was at the Brookings Institution, where he was a senior fellow, the Edward M. Bernstein Scholar, and the director of the Hamilton Project. And he was previously an assistant professor at Harvard University, University a principal analyst at CPU, a senior economist at the White House's Council of Economic Advisors, a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Treasury Department, and Assistant Director of the Division of Research and Statistics at the Federal Reserve Board. So uh, Doug has obviously been very, very busy, and uh, it's really an honor working with him over the past year at the Kennedy School and seeing his leadership on all matters, uh, both global and local. So I'd like to welcome you, Doug, to share your thoughts and remarks. Thank you, Sushma. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to welcome you to campus today uh, and to thank you and the organizers of this conference for coming together to address such an important topic. As you could tell from Sushma's introduction of me, my own background is in uh, US economic policy. But as I have come to know the Kennedy School, I've come to understand the crucial importance for the mission of the school, of the work going on here on human rights. And I think that work is especially important. As I said yesterday when I met with the advisory board for the Carr Center, I think that work is especially important for at least three reasons. The first of those is that human rights are so fundamental. Our aim at the Kennedy School is to improve public policy and public leadership around the world in order to make people's lives safer, more prosperous, and more fulfilling. And human rights are just fundamental to those goals involving basic human security, economic justice, and many other crucial issues for people. So for us to fulfill our mission, we have to be working to establish and expand human rights around the world. The second reason why this uh, work is so important to the mission of the Kennedy School is that focusing on human rights makes us and others focus on and stand up for what is right, not just for what is convenient, for some end that we think can justify some means, but to focus on what is the right way to treat people. And it is very valuable for we here at the Kennedy School and for policymakers around the world uh, to be forced to think about problems in the world in that way. And I think the third reason why this is so important for the Kennedy School's mission is that we have an opportunity to make a tremendous difference. There is a great attention in the world now to human rights issues. There are uh, tools available for recording and analyzing human rights violations. Uh, and we have a terrific set of people at the Kennedy School and around Harvard University and partners outside of Harvard who can help us advance this work. So I am so uh, pleased myself uh, to be able to have a little bit of association uh, with the work of the Carr Center. Uh, and I am very proud as the dean of the Kennedy School uh, to have uh, this work going on here. This conference is a terrific example of both the talent here at the Kennedy School and the importance of partnerships uh, across uh, the world. Uh, I'm grateful to Doug Johnson, uh, who, as you know, is the leader of the Carr Center, and before coming to the Kennedy School, uh, was exec executive director of the uh, Minnesota-based uh, Center for the Victims of Torture, uh, which ran the largest treatment program for torture victims in the world. I'm also grateful to Alberto Mora, uh, who is uh, now a senior fellow at the Carr Center, but as you know, is general counsel of the U.S. Navy, and in that role, uh, he uh, led efforts 
efforts to stop the harsh interrogation um, uh, treatment at Guantanamo. Uh, I wanted JFK Profiles Encourage Award for doing that. Uh, I'm also uh, very grateful for our partners in this project, uh, our friends from the US Military Academy uh, at West Point, uh, and also uh, the University of Trento, University of Toulouse, and the International Bar Association, as well as the supporters of this project, uh, the Sooner Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. Uh, to all of you who have gathered here today, uh, we appreciate your coming uh, to help us advance this important work. And we're looking forward to a very uh, interesting uh, and important discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, uh, for your leadership at the Kennedy School and your support of the Carr Center. For those of you who aren't as familiar with the center, uh, we're focused on global justice, realizing global justice through theory, policy, and practice. We have four broad pillars, human security, institutions of global governance and civil society, economic justice, and equality and discrimination. It's been really an honor and privilege to work with many of you in the room, Luis Moreno Campo, Catherine Sicking, Doug Johnson, and others in developing this new vision and the priorities for the center. Uh, you'll hear more about the Center and our work over the coming two days, uh, but I want to turn it over now and introduce Lieutenant Colonel Winston Williams. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Law at the U.S. Military Academy, West Point. He currently teaches constitutional and military law. He began his military service as an engineer officer in 98 and transitioned to the Judge General's Corps upon graduation from law school in 2004. He served in a number of legal positions advising commanders on a broad spectrum of legal issues related to criminal law, international law, and administrative law. He deployed to Iraq from 2006 to 2007 with the 3rd Brigade 82nd Airborne Division. He served as an Associate Professor of International and Operational Law at the Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Welcome. teaching them today, this time next year, they're going to be out in the field uh, leading soldiers at the tactical level. So the dialogue from that conference uh, really uh, hit home with us. And we were able to uh, gather together collective themes uh, from that conference. And what we, what we saw as we, we began to bring these ideas together is the indis how indispensable character and leadership and the role that it plays in Ident identifying incidents of torture, and also preventing incidents of torture. And for an academy like West Point that is geared toward developing leaders of character, this was very important to us. And it impacted, had a direct impact on how we teach uh, the block on obedience to orders and command responsibility. 
and so amongst the faculty, we held meetings to discuss how can we incorporate this into the curriculum, and we were able to do so for this semester. On top of that, another product of the Attack of Consequences of Torture conference uh, was that we had 18 participants who offered to provide submissions for a book that we are going to produce uh, based on that conference. It is truly a multidisciplinary effort, as we even have members of the math department who have contributed a chapter, and they've already turned it in. And I uh, had the opportunity to read it. It's on modeling torture. How would you approach uh, modeling torture? So truly multidisciplinary effort. And Oxford has agreed to publish this book. And we are well on our way as we begin to get more and more submissions in uh, by the deadline. So consequently, as a team, we learned from the first conference. And the real value of today's conference is that we are able to share perspectives that will enable us to further the goals of our respective organizations and an overall respect for the rule of law and human dignity. We are looking forward to having a fruitful dialogue throughout this conference as we discuss the strategic costs and consequences of torture. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Mora, thank you so much and to your team for inviting us to be a part of this project. Uh, we really, really think it's a, a noteworthy effort. And also special thank, thanks to Avery. I know you're maybe in the crowd. Or, really thanks. Thanks a lot for keeping us in the loop and, and really bringing this together. Thanks a lot. multi-billion dollar institution, the cost center actually is a very small uh, center in scope. And so um, I just want to acknowledge the, the efforts of our staff and our volunteers. And if you could just stand up a few here. Avery, Aishan, Claire, Sarah, Siham, and Nim. Um, so these are staff, fellows, and volunteers. <laughs> Douglas Johnson and Alberto Mora, who have really brought uh, vision, focus, commitment, dedication to an issue that really is uh, fundamental, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, Dean Elmendorf uh, was talking yesterday at a different car center event, and he talked about how in public policy we often uh, focus on choices, and we look at convenience, and we look at trade-offs. We're really looking at uh, some more fundamental issues of right and wrong and how to um, address those. So I'd like to introduce Douglas Johnson, who's going to uh, provide some framing remarks about the project as well as about the conference as well. He's the director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy and a lecturer in public policy here. He's been a committed advocate and supporter of human rights since the 1970s. This was when he was in kindergarten. <laughs> he launched the Infant Formula Action Coalition as a successful international boycott of Nestle. He was the first executive director of the Minnesota-based Center for Victims of Torture. Uh, and by the time he stepped down as its executive director in 2012, the center had provided care to over 23,000 survivors of torture and supported the development of rehabilitation centers around the world. So it's a very... Um, impressive set of experiences that he's brought with him, both in the field of torture as well as in the field of uh, human rights leadership that he brings to the Kennedy School. Uh, so next week is Sushma's one-year anniversary uh, at the Carr Center, and uh, boy, has she got a lot done. Uh, she does actually walk on water. I've seen it. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for coming, taking out your busy schedules to be part of this dialogue and this learning opportunity. Um, I want to just thank, at the beginning though, our uh, faculty moderators, uh, because uh, in the five panels, their role is to introduce the panelists. Um, so I'll just introduce them uh, and really give them uh, a special thanks because uh, they, uh, uh, it's hard to get a faculty show up at anything <laughs> at, at the Kennedy School because there's 13 specialized events happening each day, this being one of them. Uh, but also uh, for the intellectual leadership they provide. So first of all, um, Catherine Sickink, the Ryan family professor of human rights policy here at the Kennedy School who's moderating the first panel this afternoon. Uh, 
Graham Allison, who's the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government and the Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, and probably the single person most, uh, most associated with uh, the development of policy analysis as a necessary tool in government. Uh, Dana Bourne, a retired Brigadier uh, General of the Air Force and of the Air Force Academy, is now a lecturer in public policy at the Center for Public Leadership here at the Kennedy School. I know Dana is, I think, with the last um, workshop of our afternoon. Stephen Livingston uh, is a special case uh, because he's actually a professor of media and public affairs at George Washington University, but he's currently a senior fellow uh, at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. So we put uh, our senior fellows to work. And then uh, a special note to Colonel David Wallace, the professor of the United of the United States Military Academy and the director of the West Point Center for the Rule of Law. It's been particularly great working with uh, Winston's boss, um, <laughs> who is teaching uh, or is currently on in the car coming here uh, and, as soon as he can make it. I also wanted to make special note of our other senior fellows um, at the Car Center who are going to be participating in the workshop but have brought really decades of experience in human rights work. Um, a great deal of wisdom and all have been mentors to me over, over the decade, as several of others of you have been uh, for me. Uh, so, Luis Moreno Campo, the former uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Uh, John Shattuck, uh, who just retired as the as the president of the Central European University and as former uh, assistant secretary of state for human rights. Um, William Schultz, Bill Schultz, who for 12 years was the executive director of Amnesty International USA, and of course, Alberto Mora. Um, so we really are pleased. I think we've got a really heavy hitting group uh, working with us this year and I expect uh, to learn a great deal. My, why my throat is choking up, I don't know. So I hang <coughs> That's better. <laughs> uh, so, Ahmed Khan Brahmani. That's a name that showed up in all of our newspapers on uh, the 19th of, or the 17th of September, the New Jersey bomber. Uh, another case of someone radicalized and believing that that uh, bombing civilians uh, was a religious act. Uh, we found out a couple of days later that his father had turned him in two years before about concern about his radicalization, which brought to mind for me the, the underwear bomber uh, who was again caught on an airline crossing uh, the sea because his father was concerned about uh, the influence that radicals were having on him. And he was concerned that he was going to do something quite bad. So in either case, can you imagine that their fathers would have turned them in if they thought they would have been subjected to torture, either upon their arrest or the questioning that followed? We know that the, the underwear bomber comes just a short time after President Obama outlaws the use of so-called um, well, a forms of, of torture, and announces a new policy uh, for America. This, I believe, is one of the consequences of having a reputation for not torturing. I'm reminded of a story uh, that was told to us in our class on torture here at Harvard by Dr. Robert Fine, uh, who's sitting over back here. Uh, Robert was the um, the chair of a study for the National Science Intelligence Board on the science of interrogation. And he told us a story about meeting with a group of uh, former CIA uh, operatives whose primary task had been to recruit Soviet citizens, uh, often Soviet government officials, to function as spies for the United States. And they had been quite successful in this art of persuasion. And one of them 
during the conversation said the problem with the Bush uh, administration's interrogation policy is that they were treating they were treating it as a force problem when it actually was a recruitment problem. That's really what we're trying to understand is uh, why did we take it treated as a force problem and why was it so unattractive uh, to to continue on a policy of humane treatment and, uh, and building the reputation that the United States had uh, for, uh, for its work against torture. Why do we take our foot off the brake and put it on the gas? Uh, so the project of the Car Center on what we call the costs and consequences of the US decision to use torture emerges out of that sensibility and those sets of questions. And uh, I met Alberto Mora uh, a, a number of years ago. Uh, by that point, I had spent 20 years working for the Center for Victims of Torture. I had a reputation as being an expert on torture. I was even on the experts panel for the prevention of torture for the OSCE. So that was my, you know, that was my uh, citation. I spent one day with Alberto meeting members of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Eight hours. In eight hours, I felt I learned more about torture than I had in 20 years. Uh, because he approached it from an entirely different perspective. Obviously, I was approaching it from the experience of working directly with survivors, and Alberto was bringing it with really an understanding of, of the impact this had on US military uh, power. On, uh, on the military itself, but also on uh, U.S. policy and defense policy in particular. When Alberto showed up at Harvard two years ago uh, and said, hey, Doug, we have to do something together on this, then, of course, I jumped to the, up the chance because I knew, again, I would learn a lot. Our collaboration, you probably know, led most recently to the Foreign Affairs article that I hope all of you had a chance to read. That's the framing document for this conference. I want to just quote what the, uh, what the editor wrote to us a week after he received um, the, the draft. He says, I think this is the, really, the first really authoritative anti-torture piece that limits itself to making an argument based on national interests rather than on human rights or legal concerns. That's no small feat, and we're glad to have it. That's, of course, what we were trying to do, is to think about it uh, from a consequentialist perspective, but in particular, uh, to think more broadly than the national debate had been to that point. The national debate led by former Vice President Cheney really begins publicly only after President Obama outlaws torture. And at that point, the aggressive defense of the policy becomes public and begins to shape public opinion. That, we believe, was primarily around tactical questions. Did torture work or did it not work? We believe that the it, U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee report deals with that effectively. So again, we're not trying to address that, but we're saying let's move the conversation from tactics into strategy. Um, and that's what you're here to help us do. At the same time, about a week after that article was published, I got a, a, a very sincere, interesting email from uh, a, a, a son of survivors of the Armenian Genocide who said, I really liked this article, I learned a lot from it, but why did you not raise any of the moral issues or the legal issues about torture? And I wrote him back to say, well, because we were really wanting to focus on the other issue, uh, uh, on the issue of the consequences, uh, not the moral issues and not the legal issues. Why? Well, in part, in our efforts over the years to fight against these policies, it hasn't been clear that those arguments made any difference um, to the policymakers. Um, and instead, we were looking for 
what were what were the considerations that should have been primary in their in their brains if they were refusing to look at the moral and legal issues. So I just want to highlight um, in a kind of strange way what we're not talking about at this conference. Um, we're not talking about the long-term physical and psychological consequences of torture on victims or on perpetrators, both of which are very important issues, um, but not ones, again, that probably would sway uh, the, uh, the, the policy people who made the decisions they did. We're not talking about the history of torture and how it is so often justified as going after a few evil people, but always morphs into a fishing expedition that snatches the innocent. We are not going to talk about torture's power to sow fear um, in communities. Certainly one of the reasons I got very involved in the campaign against torture was the fear that it instilled in the clients of the center who had fled torture and believed they had come to a safe, law-abiding country and suddenly discovered they did not. But we're not going to talk about that. Nor are we going to uh, talk about the effectiveness of torture as an interrogation technique. It was a puzzle to us why people thought torture could be at all effective, especially in the thousands and thousands of survivors we worked with. Everyone confessed to something uh, because uh, it was needed by their interrogators to justify what they what they were doing. Um, it's the interrogator that's desperate for a confession, whether it's true or false. But what we know from our experience is that false testimony is so easy to obtain. But we're not going to talk about that. Nor are we going to talk about the legal arguments. Uh, the fact that torture is almost unique in international law, being both non-derogable and subject to universality of all courts in the world. We have people here who can talk about that. Luis Moreno Campo, the former ICC prosecutor. Uh, Juan Mendez, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Uh, other lawyers and representatives here. You know what the legal arguments are. And you also know how those legal arguments were warped and corroded. Um, and again, that's not primarily what we're here to talk about. And nor are we here to talk about the moral arguments. But I believe as we do talk about the strategic consequences, we will underscore that all of those reasons were in the minds of policymakers around the world, and that much of the pushback we experience, the deterioration we see in our alliances, um, the effect on soldiers in the field, the uh, encouragement it gave to our enemies as a recruitment to tool for torture. All of that happens precisely because other people did consider the moral, legal arguments, uh, the effects on community. But those are fundamental uh, to the strategic reactions uh, that we do better document. So these issues were apparently ignored. The policy analysis did not occur, and, and we are still paying the consequences. I want to end with a quote from my very brilliant wife, Catherine Sinking, uh, in a book that she wrote, a chapter on ethical argument. It essentially, she says, it's dangerous to leave consequential arguments to the consequentialists. Uh, so let's get to work. Thank you. <laughs>